Good morning, good morning, and welcome to the Tarot Parlor Podcast. This is an episode of Things That Go Bump in the Night. In this episode, we're going to go through a paranormal investigation of a house near the woods. With that said, off we go. So this small, cozy little house was sitting on the edge of the woods, and it looked very peaceful and content not revealing at all its history of tragic deaths, nor its ghostly visitors. At 100 years old, this house has a long, rich history of families and familial events and milestones. It has witnessed weddings, births, graduations, personal victories and achievements, as well as death. The present owner has experienced the loss of two family members within the walls of this house. Her mother passed away from cancer in the downstairs bedroom in 2005. And it's in this room where a frosty presence makes itself felt by sitting on the bed, complete with a physical sensation of movement and the visible indentation in the blankets. The owner's husband passed away in the den in 2008 after a long and lingering illness. And although his presence can be felt quite strongly at times, there are no visual manifestations. And it's from this room, through glass patio doors, that deer can be seen gathering at dusk near the rear of the property. It's in the den where a photograph of the owner's stepson sits a young man killed in a tragic motorcycle accident, the parents having received that devastating middle-of-the-night call all parents dread. Upon entering the house, we realized immediately that there was very strong EMF readings, beginning at the doorway between the living room and the kitchen, which was also very close to the bedroom door. Shadow figures are often seen by family members crossing the living room and disappearing into the walls. We spent a great deal of time with the owners and the EMF detector here, exploring the bedroom and the doorway between the living room and the kitchen where the EMF detector was extremely active. We also wanted to make sure that there were no electrical devices or outlets that would have been creating these readings. And this involved moving furniture, locating all the electrical outlets and letting the family take their time to tell their stories, voice their concerns, and formulate their questions. When we were finally ready to ascend the stairs, the owner told us that her grandchildren refused to go upstairs. And the way the EMF detector was working as we stood at the bottom of the steps, it was no wonder. There was an almost constant scream of protest from it. The EMF detector came on while we were at the bottom of the stairs, and it continued until we reached the doorway of the first upstairs bedroom. As investigators and homeowners stood in a clump in one room, I moved around the upstairs with the EMF detector. I so wish that we could just sit and spend some quiet time with cameras and instruments turned on, I think this would have been beneficial in catching spontaneous paranormal activity. However, the owners were enthusiastic and they wanted to watch us work, continuing their chatter and speculation the entire time. For the rest of the time that we wandered the second floor of this house, the EMF activity was sporadic at best. And as we worked our way from room to room and as we descended the stairs, it fell completely silent. The atmosphere at the bottom of the stairs was noticeably lighter. Whatever had been hovering there before seemed to be gone. The bathroom proved to be another area that drew high EMF readings, particularly in the shower, and we discovered that this presence was there one minute and gone the next, popping in and out in a dizzying fashion. We were also informed that objects in the bathroom moved around from place to place, inexplicably creating an unnerving atmosphere. Instead of spending one long block of time in this area, we would pop in and out throughout our investigation. And I have to say that those mirrored walls added an element of creepiness to this room, as you would 
catch fleeting movements in the mirror that you'd see out of the corner of your eye. And of course, by the time you turned your head to see what it was, it was gone. Around the small entryway, suspended over an old-fashioned cellar door in the floor leading to a basement, was a string of clothing. And the owner informed us that these clothes belonged to her deceased husband and that she simply couldn't bring herself to get rid of them. There was not only EMF activity here, but the strange sensation that someone was watching us as we touched the shirts or moved a hanger. After a few minutes in this area, several people felt the hair on their arms or the back of their neck stand up or experienced an uncomfortable sensation which manifested as a desire to exit the spot. So as we worked our way through this house, not only did the EMF readings and paranormal sensations unfold before us, but the story of a family and its tragedies unfolded as well. This gave us an intimate look at characters and personalities who lived in this house at one time and who still walk its rooms and hallways, as well as the dynamics of the people still living here and the long history of former occupants. It was extraordinarily interesting. The owners seemed relieved to share their stories, to watch instruments pick up visual proof of what they've known all along, and most importantly, they delighted in feeling a connection to those they loved who had passed and some sort of proof that they may still be within those walls and still visit and still stay close to those they love. And I am filming this outdoors today in a misty, dark, and rainy day, which was perfect setting for me to sit here and relay this paranormal investigation. This took place in Fremont, Nebraska many years ago, um, around the time of the first paranormal investigation that I have a video of. And I can leave a link to that up above in this video, so you can go check that one out. So, until the next time, and until the next video, bye-bye.